Thanks very much, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kate Pickett, and I'm the chair of the Greater Manchester Independent Inequalities Commission, and I'm delighted to be here this morning for the launch of the Commission's report, The Next Level, in which we set out a roadmap for creating good lives for everyone in Greater Manchester. The devastating impact of COVID and the awakenings caused by the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement have been the guiding stars for our commission. This time, this time of COVID and Black Lives Matter is the time for this place, this vibrant city region to start to realize a brighter and fairer future. And the commission's report is only the first step in taking Greater Manchester to that next level. So in the short time that we've got available to us this morning, we're just gonna be hitting some of the highlights and we hope that everyone here today will want to be part of the next steps. And after this event, you can contact Anne Lithgow at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority if you want any more information about the commission and those next steps. And I hope we'll have time for a few questions and answers before we finish today. Could I have the next slide, please? The Greater Manchester Independent Inequalities Commission was launched in October last year, and we had a six months mission to examine inequalities across the city region, consider how they should be tackled, and come up with some specific and hard hitting recommendations. And the seven commissioners are on screen now. Miata Farnbulla and Lord Simon Woolley are also going to say a few words here today. And I just want to say how hugely grateful I am to all the commissioners for their dedication, their passion and their expertise. And we've been strongly supported by teams at the New Economics Foundation and the Resolution Foundation and at the Combined Authority. Together, we've brought evidence of inequalities in Man Greater Manchester into synthesis and we've seen how those inequalities have been exacerbated by COVID. And in the short time that we've had available, we've engaged with as many people as we could. People in business, people in the public, voluntary and community sectors, and people living at the sharp end of inequalities. We asked people what change they would like to see. So thank you, everyone who engaged with us, shared your ideas, your experiences, and your hopes for the future. We have been so impressed with the openness that we've encountered at every level, from the mayor, through the combined authority, the local authorities, on down into communities, the openness of everybody we've met, their willingness to reflect, to do things differently from now on, to amplify all the good things that are already happening here in the city region, and to take those good things to the next level. Can I have the next slide, please? So our commission has viewed inequalities within a framework that thinks about how intersecting and interacting inequalities create barriers that prevent people from living the good lives they want. We recognize the deep inequalities between different groups of people, inequalities between men and women, between different ethnic groups, between those with disabilities and those without, inequalities related to sexual orientation, to language, to religion, who has access to public funds and who doesn't, and inequalities related to migration status and more. And there are deep inequalities between places as well, between neighbourhoods, for example, or between cities and towns within this region, between the north of England and the south. And we think of those as horizontal inequalities, inequalities between groups of people with different characteristics or who live in different places. And then there are the inequalities that run across society from top to bottom, what we call the vertical inequalities, inequalities of income and wealth, disparities in access to resources and to power. And the scale of those vertical inequalities, that's a measure of the social hierarchy which presses down and exacerbates all of those different horizontal inequalities. And because inequalities are so interconnected, it doesn't make sense to think that one kind matters more than another. It's the interactions and the intersections between those vertical and horizontal inequalities that produce cycles of inequality, which systematically disadvantage 
particular groups. And our aim has been to make recommendations to tackle those intersecting inequalities and the interactions between them for the benefit of everyone. And our approach has been to look at the systematic, systemic and structural root causes of those inequalities, including structural racism, seeking to understand the common drivers. So in our report, we set out a vision for good lives for everyone in Greater Manchester. And I hope you'll give time to looking at that vision. You'll find it summarised at the front of our report. We describe a city region that's working in harmony towards common goals of equality and well-being and where people are at the heart of economic development and regeneration, where people are supported when they need it throughout their lives, where there's good work, good opportunities and thriving communities. And the vision we describe is not a utopia. Every element is already happening somewhere in the city region. I told you we found a lot of good things already happening or they're happening somewhere else. They're just not all happening in the same place. And it's the Commission's vision that Greater Manchester will be the place where they do all happen. The city region that leads the world in realising that vision of equality and well-being and that this, this will be the time. And now my fellow Commissioner Miata Farnbola is going to highlight some of the steps that can take Greater Manchester to that next level. Thank you, Kate. Uh, welcome to everyone. Absolutely delighted to be here. I just wanted to sort of touch on some of the highlights that have come out in terms of recommendations. I think the first thing to say is that as Commission, we were struck by how much amazing work was being done across Greater Manchester to drive up living standards, to tackle inequality, and how actually in many respects, Greater Manchester is at the vanguard of much of local government on this. So we were really clear that actually our job was to come up with a set of practical recommendations that could put a rocket behind some of the really good work that was already happening, that could scale some of it up across the city region, knit it together to drive a new way of doing things that puts inequality at the heart of everything that Greater Manchester does. And for us, there were five key things that we thought were absolutely critical to achieving this. The first was achieving what we called an essential pivot in how we tackle inequality by putting a set of well-being and equality goals at the heart of Greater Manchester's strategy and aligning a range of budgets, activities, portfolios across the city region around this. And as part of this, bringing together anchor institutions that are so vital to the city region, from local authorities, health services, universities, colleges, schools, in order to use their collective spending power, their investment power, their soft power to tackle inequality, to support disadvantaged groups and create good, secure jobs for everyone across the city region. The second key thing for us was putting power in people's hands. You know, we were struck by the huge amounts of energy and passion from different parts of the community that understood inequality deeply because they had lived it and want to be part of cracking this problem once and for all. Greater Manchester has already taken the step of creating equality panels, so we think we should give them more teeth with a stronger mandate, resources to scrutinise, to work with public bodies, to drive progress and hold everyone to account for the things that we say we're going to do to tackle this problem. And then alongside this, we recommend setting up a people's task force to look at how we can get people involved in decision making at every level of the city region. So that the people whose lives in the end will be affected by this are the ones helping us to come up with a solution. Now, an important thread through everything that we were doing was this issue of structural racism, which the Black Lives Matter movement has forced us to confront once and for all. And across the report, we have suggested a range of recommendations that we, can th that we think will tackle this. But alongside that, a really critical piece for us was that we think that the city region needs a race and equality strategy backed by an ambitious plan to increase representation of Black and Asian minorities in senior positions across the combined authority and tackle race inequality in health, in education, in policing, in work and housing. The third key area for us is creating good jobs and decent pay across the city region without which we cannot lift people up. To enable this, we recommend the Greater Manchester should create Greek GM Works. 
a city region wide initiative that would bring together the combined authority, local authorities, the LEP, universities, colleges, the growth companies, and local businesses to do the job of thinking about what is the investment that we're going to put in frontier, in green and foundational economy sectors that will be the growth sectors of the future, to identify what skills we need when we create those jobs, and to create a training offer to reskill and upskill local people for these jobs alongside a targeted placement schemes that will target disadvantaged groups with coaching, with training, with support, a job guarantee, a paid apprenticeship in order to get people into the jobs that we're creating. Alongside that, we recommend the Greater Manchester to set an ambitious target for every employer across the city region to pay the living wage, to offer living hours by 2030, using the fantastic momentum that has been created by the Good Employment Charter and the investment, the procurement, the soft power of anchor institutions to get there. Fourth, we were clear that to tackle inequality, you've got to build wealth. You've got to build wealth and you've got to find ways of sharing it across the community. And here we already have local authorities across the city region, including Wigan, Salford, Stockport, that are already adopting community wealth building approaches. And we think we need to put a huge rocket boost behind this with a community wealth hub across the city region to support and grow cooperatives, social community enterprises that can be owned by everyone across the city region and ensure that the benefits uh, pass on to them. Alongside thinking about a community investment platform that would tap into local savings, tap into local investment to unlock investment, to buy up community assets like land, like property, put them in use in service of the community, and then ensure that the wealth that is generated from these are ploughed back to help people across the community. And then fifth and finally, we think that a key part of getting to a Greater Manchester that supports good lives is moving towards a bit model of universal basic services in which education, health, childcare, adult social care, housing, transport and digital connectivity are that are foundational to our well-being are provided to everyone that needs it. Now, we understand that to get there, this requires Greater Manchester to prize, and I use the language of prize deliberately, funding and resources and power out of Whitehall. And we support the city region in, in its ongoing fight to do this. But we also think that there are things that the city region can and it must do now in order to make this a reality. Two things for us, alongside the amazing and fantastic work that has already been done on health and social care that we think stand out for attention, is on education and housing. And on education, we think Greater Manchester should be launching an education challenge to give every child an equal start in life by levelling up schools in deprived communities, supporting young people in that critical transition at 16, and improving access to the activities that build their skills, their confidence and their resi uh, resilience. This for us must be foundational to how we ensure that the next generation that has been so hard hit by this pandemic have a fighting chance uh, to do better. On housing, we think the city region should continue to scale up public and social sector house building to deliver affordable, decent homes with a target of getting to half of homes built in 15 years being affordable, backed by a plan to acquire land, rental properties, commercial properties to build social housing and convert to social housing. And then we think that Manchester, because it is in the, in the vanguard of thinking about innovative models, should use the Greater Manchester model, this integrated model of public services in 10 pathfinder deprived neighbourhoods and pilot a minimum income guarantee in one or more of these areas in order to test and drive forward innovation in trying to get to in, uh, tackle inequality. Now, to finish, the final thing I'll say is that we are very clear that none of this is a silver bullet. But we believe that this, together these recommendations can allow Greater Manchester to make the essential pivot that it must do to, in order to tackle inequality and to deliver on this ambition of a good life for all across the city region. And, you know, our view is that this is going to be hard. It's going to be painstaking work. But this is the moment to embark on it as we respond to one of the biggest economic crises that we have faced, 
that is shaking our foundations to the core, yes, but has shone a huge spotlight on the inequalities that we must and we can tackle. I'll stop there and I'll pass over to Simon, who will say a few words on how we tackle structural inequality and what we must prioritise in trying to do that. Simon. Thank you very much, Miata, and thank you, uh, Kate, too. Uh, you fantastically chaired this commission, and I sat at, alongside some wonderful people that gave so much passion to, to this agenda. M my name's uh, Simon Woolley. I'm, a, I'm an activist, an activist fighting for social and racial justice. Uh, now, uh, an activist in the House of Lords, but doing the same nonetheless. Look, we've had an extraordinary year, an extraordinary year with COVID-19 and the, the death of George Floyd that has laid bare some of the most profound structural inequalities that have shocked all of us to the core. We thought things were bad, but when COVID came and shone a light and laid bare those deep-seated inequalities. We were all struck by that. And then we had the death of George Floyd, in which tens of thousands of people from Manchester and around the country came onto the streets demanding change, demanding that leaders step up to the plate, acknowledge and deliver. Uh, I'm proud to say that the that Andy Burnham was one of those leaders that stepped up to the plate. And he said, I'm listening, I'm noting, and I want you to go away and deliver a set of recommendations that will transform our city. Don't be afraid, be bold, be brave. And it is right, it is right to give us that instruction and what we found over the, the, the weeks and months, uh, Mayor Andy Burnham, and you'll be proud of this, is that this was a time for leaders, you stepped up, but when we are around the Greater Manchester, we found many more leaders doing unbelievable stuff. What we said to them was, it's time for you to come out of the shadows. It's time for you to believe in yourselves to sew a golden thread with that energy, with that dynamism, and bring it to bear on this enormous challenge. Uh, we don't just want to build back better. We want to build new better. We want to show that all those elements within Greater Manchester join arms in this huge, huge challenge. We want to inspire, we want to encourage. You know, I, I was really, really uh, humbled and pleased listening to Miata because uh, these are very, very ambitious recommendations, uh, Mayor. They're extremely ambitious. They're desirable, but they're achievable. And when we deliver on this, Mayor, we transform people's lives. You and I have been on this journey for over 25 years, fighting for social and racial justice. This report with leadership is a beacon, is a beacon of hope, a beacon of recovery. Uh, our commission is pretty clear about this. We want this, this report under leadership. You know, when I see this, uh, Andy, I see that 159 people plus on this call and what you and I must tell them is this one fact. They are the leaders. <laughs> it's not just you. It's not just me. It's not just Kate. It's, it's them too. And it's time that they owned it and they ran with it because, because now is our time. I'll, I'll leave you on this, that in 50 years time, historians will look back on this monumental time in our history and ask but one question to this enormous uh, double pandemic, this perfect storm, what was our response? What did we do? How did we show leadership? Today's the beginning 
And I, I as a humble activist, am proud to be part of this commission and the recommendations we put forward. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Miata and Simon. We're going to hand over now to Councillor Brenda Warrington, leader of Thameside Council and Portfolio Lead for Equalities. Thank you, Brenda. Well, thank you, Kate, uh, and thank you for the introduction. Um, as you say, um, I lead uh, on ageing and equalities on behalf of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and, of course, all of the uh, leaders in Greater Manchester. And can I Firstly, um, express my thanks uh, to Kate, to Miata, to Simon for the presentations this morning, very, very powerful, but also all of the Commission, because you have done such tremendous work and, and frankly, in such a short period of time, you, you have achieved so much in, in the six months that we asked you to. It really is tremendous. So thank you for that work. I, I particularly welcome this report and uh, I can't wait to actually have the time uh, now that I've got it to sit down and read the full uh, version in detail. And of course, we know that we need to embed tackling inequality across everything that we do. And recently, Kate, you mentioned it, um, I have established the Tackling Inequality Board to actually drive this uh, work forward. And it's been said there absolutely is a need to shift that dial and COVID-19 has exposed uh, what happens when we do have those deep inequalities and poverty that exist in our communities and it's clear that some groups in our society have suffered far more than others as a result of the pandemic and some will struggle more in the aftermath as we rebuild our economy. And Kate, I share your vision, but I equally realise that there is a tremendous amount of work that's needed to be done over the coming months and the coming years. The inequalities that we know exist are deep rooted. They have been worsened and not just by COVID-19, but also by previous years of funding cuts to our local authority budgets. And so going forward, we must consider your ideas for new ways of working and work with our partners from across business, uh, the voluntary community, faith and social enterprise sectors to prioritise this work. We should build the strength of our Greater Manchester Equalities panels and we will have seven functioning panels very soon and they will speak for their communities of identity and inform the actions that we take. And I will be taking this report to the combined authority later this morning, in fact, and I will seek the support of members uh, to respond to the challenge that you've set us. And of course, we will be taking action to tackle those equalities across the whole of Greater Manchester. And we're also planning to share the report directly with key meetings and groups, including the Reform Board, the Growth Board, but also we'll bring it to the equalities panels, the Greater Manchester um, Voluntary Community and Social Enterprise Equalities Alliance, the <clears throat> Voluntary Community and Social Enterprise Leadership Group, GM Housing Providers, and we will share with all of our health system colleagues too. And of course, there are many, many challenges that you've set. And I do uh, appreciate Miata that you recognised the amazing work that is already being done in Greater Manchester. But of course, that is the tip of the iceberg and we do need to build on that. But it's pleasing that you did recognise what we have uh, begun to do. And I, I think, Simon, uh, to close, I do agree with you. The scale of the recommendations are extremely ambitious, but they are achievable. And I do thank you for pointing that out to us. Mm -hmm. And I know that we will welcome <clears throat> our questions today, uh, but we will be doing some um, very, very close, deep work um, to tackle our uh, inequalities across Greater Manchester. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough for the work that you've done 
the direction that you've led us in. And of course, um, we will, I'm sure, be taking on board your recommendations, although that will be the decision of the combined authority a little later this morning. Thank you very, very much. And now, if I can uh, introduce uh, Andy Burnham, uh, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, uh, to add his comments. Thank you, Andy. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much indeed, Brenda. Morning, everybody. I'm just going to start by uh, throwing some praise in your direction, Brenda, because you have brought massive energy and great leadership uh, to, to this uh, this amazing uh, programme of work. So, you know, we're all deeply grateful to you. Uh, and I just hope you continue to uh, take the report forward in the way that you've you, you've brought us to this uh, point. I also want to just thank everybody on the call. As Simon said, there's almost 170 people here uh, on this call this morning uh, from all walks of life in Greater Manchester, leaders, chief execs, people who run organisations, but also uh, people who just do a whole, whole range of different things. You know, the fact that they're all tuned into this discussion on a rainy Manchester morning says a lot, I think, about this uh, uh, this this place and how grateful they are and we are uh, to you, Kate, uh, to you, Miata, uh, to you, Simon, and all of the commissioners uh, for what you've given us, because you've lifted us, you've fired us up, actually, and you've given us hope for what we can do uh, from where we, from where we uh, currently are. I think as a commission, you've done great service, not just for Greater Manchester, but for the whole of the United Kingdom. Why? Because you are the group of people that has so far delivered the most convincing plan to level up the country that has yet been produced. Leveling up cannot be about scattering a bit of capital funding to favoured places here and there. It has to be a serious strategic bottom-up drive carried out at scale to improve people's homes, people's jobs, people's communities, truly good lives for all. That, that's how we get good lives for all, if we focus on, on those things. But the brutal truth is, and Kate, you expressed this in your foreword, that the pandemic uh, has exposed something that is a very unpalatable, but nevertheless uh, essential truth that the quality of some people's work and some people's housing situations has become so poor in this country that it has left them unable to protect their health, the health of their family and the health of people around them in a global pandemic. That is the brutal reality. Some people have never been able to stay at home. They've never been able or supported to, to isolate when they've needed to or been asked uh, to do so because of fear of loss of income or indeed the loss of their job. And here is where this uh, brings forward issues around structural racism that Miata uh, spoke so uh, powerfully about. The reality is in this city region, but it's true of the rest of the country, our black community, our Asian communities, all uh, minority communities are overrepresented in the professions that have been most at risk uh, throughout uh, throughout the pandemic, and that is down to uh, the unconscious bias, the, the, the discrimination that is just there. Uh, that explains uh, why that is the case. So our most, our least affluent communities have had case rates in this pandemic, uh, and sadly death rates, which are double, more than double, those in the more affluent parts of the country. So it's why I say that levelling up to have any credibility starts in the least affluent areas, but it starts with people and not just infrastructure. And it starts with work, homes and communities. Let me just say something briefly on those things and touch on your, your recommendations uh, that Miata took us through. On work, we will embrace your idea of becoming a living wage city region. We think that's good for business as well as people. If you treat people properly, you get more from people and your business will be more successful. So we will link our good employment charter, the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter, to all public procurement in Greater Manchester, particularly those anchor institutions that you, you, you talk about. 
Uh, and that is something that I think we can commit to today, Brenda, isn't it, to, to, to do that. On people's homes, we accept what you're saying about the need to improve and expand uh, the social rented uh, housing stock. I'm pleased to say that the Greater Manchester Combined Authority will this morning uh, consider a proposal for a good landlord charter, an attempt to drive up standards in the private rented sector, as you are uh, encouraging us uh, to do. So we're making a start, but you're challenging us to go much further. And you know, we, we, we will we, we take the ambition and we'll have to work out the detail. On people's communities, I love the idea of a community wealth hub, boosting our co-ops, the number of co-ops that we have, our social enterprises, our voluntary and community organisations, which are essential to this agenda. And I've often spoken, we need a new relationship or an even stronger relationship between the public sector and our voluntary and community sector. That is what's happened over the last year. And we need to take that forward now. And really, they are equal partners in this endeavour to level up our people and level up our communities. And they need to be treated as such and always in the room when we're having these discussions. The idea of universal basic services, Miata, is a fantastic idea, you know, basic services that are affordable to everybody, that work for everybody. We took a major decision yesterday after 35 years of deregulation of bus transport in Greater Manchester, which, as we know, is predominantly used by women and people from uh, less affluent uh, communities. We took a decision to bring our buses back under public control so that we can build here a London-style public transport system that is much more affordable to people. But going beyond that, I'm just going to finish with a reflection on, on my work as mayor over the last few years. I, I think we need to, to work with government on this and, and, and change the way we do things as a, as a country. My work on homelessness has, has, has shown me this. If you set people up to succeed with what they need to have a good life, they will succeed. But if you set people up to fail, they will fail, sadly. And we have reached a point in this country where we are setting millions of people up to fail because we don't give them a job that gives them basic day-to-day -day security over how much they will earn. And because they don't have that, they spend every day worrying about whether they can keep their home. So people are living in a state of constant mental stress about whether or not they can hold all this together. They don't have well-being because of that. It's a toxic situation. If you put strong foundations beneath everybody with respect to their job, their home, their income, then you will see um, people succeed. And that's what I've seen with our Housing First uh, project, where we've given people breathing space and time to recover and they have taken it and have succeeded and moved and moved forward. So, Kate, just over a decade ago, you changed the way I thought about inequality with your book, The Spirit Level, and you've uh, done it again with your commissioners uh, with uh, Good Lives uh, for All. There's no need for us to feel downcast. We can do more for ourselves as we did yesterday by taking control of our buses. To quote Simon, now is our time. Why, why shouldn't it be our time? Now let's claim it as our, as our time. Building back better is in danger of becoming the next empty slogan if we are not uh, careful. But actually what you have given us is a plan that shows that it can be real and it can change this country for the better if, if we do the things that you are suggesting, improve people's work, homes, lives, incomes, communities. We are committed to it, as Brenda has said, and we will uh, take it to our leaders and ask them to, to endorse it. But if we get the government behind this as well, then I will begin to believe that we can build back better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy.
Um, we've got a couple of questions um, which um, would like to put to you and, and they pick up on a lot of the themes that have been talked about. Uh, I think this one is for you, Kay, and the commissioners. Um, how does the commission see the economic role of thousands of BCFSE organisations as anchor institutions um, rooted in place, developing jobs and employability? Thanks, Pam. That, that's a really good question. I think we've tended to think about anchor institutions as the big institutions in our communities, you know, the big businesses, um, the public sector employers, the NHS, the universities and the colleges. But it's really true, actually, that the voluntary community and social enterprise sector is an anchored sector. That's very true. Um, they do improve um, employability and enterprise possibilities and create jobs directly in communities. So in our encouragement to you, Andy, as mayor, to convene an anchor network across the city region, I think we should view the voluntary community and social enterprise sector as being an anchored sector that is part of that network. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. And I think this next question is maybe for Brenda uh, and for Andy. And this is about ensuring that equality is built into the decision making uh, processes uh, across Greater Manchester. And how are we going to ensure that happens as a consequence of this report? That's, that's for you, Brenda. Yeah. OK, thank you, Pam. Um, well, that's certainly something that we have already um, sought to establish with leaders. Leaders have very much um, bought into this and the, the principle of building inequalities across all of our policies, all of our decisions is starting to be very, very embedded already. And, and I'm really pleased about that. And, you know, we do ask uh, every decision to have uh, a question. Have you considered uh, the impact on equalities? And, uh, and I do believe that uh, that is something that um, all of our districts are starting to work with and build in. That, that is my understanding. But of course, it is something that our leaders will confirm to me as we move forward and as we embed uh, the need for um, equalities to be continually at the forefront of everything that we do, everything that we decide. Uh, and, uh, you know, people will naturally not even start to think about it soon, it will be quite, um, you know, j j just a course of action that they do naturally. Thank you, Brenda. And I think this one might be for Kay, and I think it, this will have to be kind of our final question because I know that we are uh, really short <coughs> on, on, on time this morning. And that's about how do we ensure that race equality doesn't just stay within that race equality panel? Um, and that it, it goes beyond the boundaries um, of that panel. So that, I think that might be a question for Kate. Sure, I think that's about our first recommendation, actually, which is to put wellbeing and equality targets in place um, right at the heart of the Greater Manchester strategy, which I know you're refreshing over the next few months and hope to publish a new strategy in the autumn. And we just need to make sure that those targets address all of the different kinds of intersecting inequalities that I talked about earlier, and that those targets are there in every policy. So it's not just about having a separate race equality strategy. It's about thinking about all of those inequalities at the heart of everything that happens. And I think there are lots of ways you can do that. I think there's lots of learning you can draw on from across the world about what those targets should look like. And then you put bottom targets in so you make sure nobody's falling below and you think about the distribution of things and you think about the distribution across your localities. You build that in and then you can see all the time you can measure yourself against the progress you make in tackling all of those different inequalities. And it stops it stops racial inequality being in a single basket and it just starts to think about all inequalities in a holistic way. Pam, I think Jen Williams from the MEN has put a question up. So 
if we've just got time to sneak that that one in, I think we, we probably should. Yeah, I can see that one. Thank you. Sorry to. No, that's that's quite all right. It's a team effort as always. <laughs> um, um, I think what Jenny's saying is that some of the plan requires a lot of political buy-in from local authorities in order to prevent this simply being another report. Do you think that that buy-in will be there on the report's specific recommendations? And secondly, the CA is signing off 16 million in loans to another large development with no affordable housing this morning. Given that this is already a policy lever at your disposal now, do you think that choice fits with the report's recommendations? So I think this is kind of a two-headed <laughs> yeah. deal with one. <laughs> Andy. I, I think the buy-in will be there. I think Brenda's right. I think, you know, Greater Manchester has, I think, undergone a change in the last few years in that we understood that wealth, we understand that wealth is built from uh, the bottom up. And you know, you can't just kind of bring sort of new industry and jobs to the city centre and expect all of Greater Manchester then to, to benefit. It will benefit some and parts of the city region. But if you want to uh, bring everybody um, uh, up and give everyone good lives for all, it, it does require a, a focus on the fundamentals of life that we've been we've been talking about today. And I think that's that's understood. I can see Brenda nodding. I think you know it's it's challenging, of course, given the resources that local authorities have at their disposal. You know, the hollowing out, the hollowing out of local government is is in itself an act of levelling down, not up, uh, because councils are the kind of first agents of trying to level up their places, aren't they? So how you you square sort of throwing out bits and bobs of funding from a levelling up fund while cutting councils? Well, that. that it, well, it doesn't make any sense, does it? So that's why I said at the start, levelling up doesn't have a credible uh, plan at the moment. And Kate and her commissioners have got closest to, to giving us one. And we will do as much of it with it as we can, won't we, Brenda? Um, <clears throat> without then, you know, going, you know, having then to knock on the door of the government. I don't want to ignore Jen's second question, because I don't know the, the details of this the, the scheme. And the City Mayor of Salford will set that out, this individual scheme. But Jen, I want to talk about the Housing Investment Loan Fund, which is the overall um, kind of policy that this sits under. Of course, the terms of that fund were constrained when it was given to us by the Treasury. I'm, I'm not going to make an excuse here because what we're doing is we are, from the loans that are being let through that scheme, we are building a surplus that is then going back in to achieve our wider housing ambitions for, for everybody. The, that's why I was enthusiastic about the recommendation, the commitment, the, the um uh, the the uh, commissioners have made the good landlord charter, the Greater Manchester Good Landlord Charter. The money we're setting aside for that today comes from loans repaid to the Greater Manchester Housing Investment Loan Fund. So we we get the money and then we redistribute that money, obviously to improve uh, improve people's homes elsewhere. So I think it's important to look at the kind of the way we're operating the fund in the in the whole, if you like, rather than just looking at an individual scheme. Can I just uh, add, Andy, um, just going back to the first part of Jen's question, that I am absolutely confident that all 10 Greater Manchester leaders are absolutely committed to improving the inequalities across the whole of Greater Manchester. And I know that they have bought into the principle of needing to do that. And I'm confident that um, the report that's before us this morning will be endorsed uh, later today. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, Andy, there is a question about GMP that Jen's put in the chat around the race equality review um, and uh, an update on that. So I'm not sure if you're able to answer that now or that's something that you can answer later. Uh, I, I can give a very quick answer, uh, uh, Pam. So uh, thank you for bringing that to my attention. So uh, colleagues will know we've set up our Greater Manchester Race Equality um, Panel. What Brenda did, as I said, fantastic work to uh, get real energy into, into this. So we are asking the, the panel to advise us on uh, the review, how it should be um, uh, the commentary around it, how it should be uh, presented. So we don't we don't want just to throw things out without it being properly uh, considered by our race equality panel. So they're looking at it, and I I, I guess as soon as we can, um, following the uh, the PERDA period that we're going into, we will we will put that into the into the public domain in the right way, 
um, and we will certainly do it side by side with our race race equality panel. Thanks, Sandy. Um, that's all time we have um, for questions uh, this morning. Um, I think you'll agree um, that it's been um, a really good session this morning and uh, a great way to launch such an important and impactful uh, report. Uh, Brenda, I just wondered if you wanted to say anything finally. I think the only thing I can continue to say is thank you so much to Kate, to Miata, to Simon, to the whole team uh, that have formed this commission for us. Thank you for the guidance you're going to, you know, you've given us in the uh, report. And I know, uh, I'm absolutely confident that we will endorse it. And I'm absolutely confident that we will make best use uh, of all of the recommendations um, as quickly as possible. It won't be an overnight uh, fix, we know that, but I think we can make a very steady uh, progress on what we need to do. We need to identify our priorities, which we will, and of course, we will get to work uh, very, very quickly. As Andy said, we're moving into a purge situation, but uh, come the other side of that, you know, we will be back at it, believe me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, everybody, for attending this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Miata. Simon, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.